It's, it's really my pleasure this evening to introduce a, a longtime member of our club and a, a good friend, uh, Mike Britton. Um, and he's going to talk to us tonight about uh, containers for bonsai. And I think that Mike and I both Thank use the term. Hello? Uh, Mike and I both use the term containers uh, advisedly because uh, I think we too, we, we too often uh, just refer to pots and pots as ceramic objects are generally the things that most bonsai grow in or are trained to grow in. Uh, but there are other options for, for containers as well. Um, I think one of the first things that we're all taught uh, when we get involved with bonsai is that um, coniferous plants are planted in unglazed containers and, and deciduous and other kinds of trees are planted in glazed containers. And, and that's a sort of simplification, sometimes doesn't always apply. Uh, but there, I think as you get more and more involved uh, with the art of bonsai, you begin to realize that there are a lot more um, subtle distinctions between uh, one container and another uh, from a horticultural as well as an aesthetic uh, standpoint. And I know that Mike is gonna speak to both of those areas and maybe more uh, this evening as he presents his, uh, his presentation. Um, I was communicating with Mike yesterday and today and he mentioned that one of the first bonsai, one of the first RMBS uh, workshops that he had, that he came to was at our house in Boulder, and he said he was astounded at the uh, um, number of of pots that we had in our in our collection, uh, which I have to attribute mainly to those pots being collected by my wife over a long period of time, and. Uh, uh, very few of them are, are really valuable, uh, but I think having uh, a range in, a, in an inventory of containers for bonsai is a is really a good thing. Uh, and if any of you have seen me do a, a a potting a repotting workshop, you know that I advocate for having a. Uh, a a range of options for what to put that tree into the next time around. Because if you're focused on one pot, that may or may not work. So I encourage everybody to uh, find avenues for um, collecting uh, bonsai containers, small and large and different sizes and different glazes and um, and then when you're ready to repot a tree, you may have two or three or four uh, different options, uh, depending on what's going on with the roots of that tree. So um, I think you'll find Mike's presentation, which I previewed, uh, very, very interesting and very thorough. So please hang in there and stay with him. <laughs> and without further ado, I will introduce Mike Britton. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Tom. And uh, yeah, I was astounded by your collection of pots in the garage there. And um, I'd also say for new members, one of the best things about the Bonsai Society is if you can get to not only meetings, whether it's Zoom, not so good, but in person. But if you can go to the workshops, um, you learn a lot, you meet people, you know, it's just amazing how much you progress. I started in Bonsai in 1990. Uh, I, I had little kids uh, too, and I, I couldn't get to the uh, meetings until like around 2010, 11. Um, but my abilities in bonsai, my knowledge and everything just increased by being a member. So um, yeah, and um, let's see, is there anything else? Um, I think I'll try to share my screen. Tell me if this works. Um, can you all see that? It's probably a little delay. 
There you go. Does that come through? Can you see a full screen of a, a painting? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. So, um, like I said, I've been doing bonsai since about 1990. Uh, and I consider myself sort of intermediate in terms of my abilities. Sometimes I have a really nice tree and I think I'm doing great. And I think, well, maybe I'm getting to be an expert and then something happens and I start thinking I'm a beginner. <laughs> so it's a, uh, I think somebody said it's humbling uh, and I agree with that. Um, I am really interested to do this presentation because it, by doing research on containers, horticulture, aesthetics, uh, I learn a lot and it helps me put together my thinking on what makes a good container and what makes a good presentation and how to keep a tree healthy. So that's, that's why I was interested in doing this one. Um, last fall, I went to Taos and uh, I really love art. And one of my favorite American painters is Ernest Blumenshine. He's one of the Taos Six. They started in 1915, the Taos Art Colony. Um, and this painting, you know, I really think is awesome. There's an analogy with a painting and a picture frame that uh, is similar to a bonsai with a container. Let's see, is my screen advancing? Um, in the Blumenshine Museum in Taos, uh, I didn't know this, but the Taos six who started that art colony were taken by Japanese art. And he had a number of Japanese prints and paintings. And then this um, painting that he did for a Rudyard Kipling novel, I think shows that Japanese influence. So um, a bonsai is to the container as a picture is to the frame, I think is an apt analogy. Uh, if you want a definition of bonsai, uh, a good place to go is the uh, website for Eisenen Bonsai, Bjorn Bjornholm's site. And he defines that, you know, basically bonsai is to plant uh, a tree in a container. Uh, if you're interested in bonsai history, he has um, relatively new, I hadn't seen it, uh, nice, concise article on the history of bonsai. I recommend you take a look at it. So here's this analogy, bonsai uh, and container and picture and frame. And I thought, well, in bonsai, you have to have the container in uh, pictures and paintings. A lot of modern art doesn't even have frames anymore, but I was wrong. I, I don't know if anybody has seen this, but there's a fellow in Japan who's doing air bonsai, and uh, this is actually uh, not a tree. It's a kusamono or a herbaceous planting, but um, maybe it's a little gimmicky, but the plant is actually uh, floating in the air and doesn't have a container at all. Has anyone seen that? Yeah. It, it, if, you, uh, if you want, there's the link. And, and I think uh, this presentation will go on the... Uh, the Rocky Mountain Bonsai Society website, and so you can get all the links uh, that I include in the presentation. All right, so I did a lot of research for this presentation. Uh, here are some of my sources, the main ones. Uh, Bonsai Today is a magazine. I don't think it's still in publication, but there was an issue in 1992, number 17. It had a great uh, article on repotting, and it included a lot of information on pots. The authors, there were probably 20 of them, all of them Japanese, including Kimura, maybe one of the most famous bonsai artists in the world. Another uh, really good source of information is Bonsai Techniques 1 and 2 by John Naka. Uh, it's out of print. You can get them online, though. They're pricey. So I borrowed them from Larry Jackal. Uh, thanks to Larry for that. But Really good source of information. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great reference. Another good book that I recommend that is accessible is David Groot's Principles of Boneside Design. Um, 
I don't know if any of you all are Mirai Live members. That's another really good source of information. Um, there's two videos in his live stream uh, library, and I especially recommend that ceramics breakdown. Uh, and then he has some podcasts with uh, well-known bonsai potters that are really uh, interesting and fun to listen to. I already mentioned Eisen N, uh, Bjorn Bjorholm's site, a uh, really good place for information as well. And he does videos. Uh, and then finally, I have a number of photos of trees from the Kokufu 10 show. It's the annual show in Japan. It's probably the most prestigious bonsai show in the world. Uh, so I got those from Bill Valvanis's bonsai blog. All right, so, and, and Tom alluded to this, um, the container in bonsai has a uh, set of horticultural functions and also aesthetic, and sometimes they're at odds. Um, I won't go through these now, but there's a whole list for horticulture you need to pay attention to, and then for aesthetics, you need to pay attention to these different aspects of the container, and that uh, makes for um, a challenge. It's, it's a little bit difficult, I would say. If you just wanted to grow healthy trees, you would probably use a container like this. Um, what the nursery industry uses, tall cylindrical pots. They're plastic. Plastic isn't great, but they're cheap <laughs> and they work. But being tall and cylindrical, the water moves through the pot quickly by the force of uh, gravity on that water or on that soil column, uh, and it draws air in behind it. And, and bonsai roots need both air and water to be healthy. Um, these nursery containers have lots of drainage holes. I think this one has eight or nine, and they have feet so that the tree or the pot doesn't sit on the bench and prevent water from draining out. They have a relatively large ratio of root mass to foliage. And they also are really ideally shaped for maintaining thermal inertia, if you will. They don't get too hot too fast or too cold too fast. So that's why the nursery industry uses these. Uh, and, you know, they spent probably millions of dollars researching the ideal uh, and most cost-effective way to raise trees uh, in a healthy way. So one thing we do in bonsai is we challenge ourselves because it's easy to keep a tree healthy in a nursery container, but when you move to a bonsai container, you lose a lot of those advantages. They're shallow, um, water moves through these much more slowly because the soil column is shallow and gravity isn't pulling the water down and out the drainage holes as quickly. Uh, and it doesn't draw as much air in behind to um, allow the roots to metabolize. There's fewer drainage holes in bonsai pots. Uh, there's a relatively small ratio of root mass to the foliage mass. And this is probably the worst shape for maintaining thermal inertia or keeping these things from fluctuating too much in, in summer or in winter. So we challenge ourselves right off the bat with bonsai. I, I already covered a little bit, bit of this, but balancing water and oxygen, if you are a Mirai Live member, um, you listen to Ryan Neal, the host of that, and he, he pounds on that. that. That's the foundation of good bonsai is giving the roots good amount of water and balancing that with the oxygen. That's why we use a coarse inorganic bonsai mix. Um, a lot of our AMBS members use uh, pumice, lava rock and akadama in a one 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 ratio because it holds some water, but it also provides good aeration. It's also why we will do things like water our trees and then tip the pots up a little bit to help them drain the water and pull in more oxygen. Another good way to help uh, your trees be more um, healthy is by putting containers on the ground. Uh, that helps prevent 
great fluctuations in the temperature. You know, the average ground temperature, you know, an inch or two below the ground is probably in the 50s, 60s usually, uh, and trees like that. So um, especially in winter, we'll put our trees in the ground to keep them from fluctuating greatly. Um, in the summertime, a lot of RMBS members will shade their containers from direct sun by maybe putting a um, styrofoam on the south side of the pot uh, at the Denver Botanic Gardens. Larry Jackal, the curator, puts the trees on these. Um, there's some sort of organic mat, like almost a doormat. And in the morning, he'll soak those in water to help keep the pots up on the benches from getting too hot. All right, so I, I talked about the functions horticulturally of the bonsai container. You know, it basically contains the root and soil and it makes the bonsai portable, right? Because if it's not portable, it's a garden tree or uh, it's not a bonsai. You can't take it to a show. You can't move it into the uh, greenhouse for protection or into the garage or whatever it is. It's also... Um, a function of the container and bonsai to slow the growth of the tree. Now, this is a heritage tree at the Botanic Gardens, and it's in a fairly tight container, as you can see, and that'll slow the growth of this ficus, uh, which is probably once you want, <clears throat> excuse me, once your tree is uh, in a state where it's refined and ready to be shown. The same thing happens in the wild. Here's a Rocky Mountain juniper in a tight crack. Um, here's a ponderosa pine also growing in granite in a very uh, tight crack. It's, uh, these trees are both about two feet high and they're, they're natural bonsai, if you will. Another function, of the, well, another example of this is uh, this ponderosa pine. Um, I've had this for about 20 years and it's been in a bonsai pot for 15 years. And they're, well, in the wild, they have really long needles, four and five or six inches sometimes. You put them in a bonsai container and leave them in there for 15 years and the needles really shorten up. <clears throat> This is um, a close up of the needles. Many of the needles on this tree are only an inch or inch and a half in length. I, I took this tree to a workshop uh, about a year ago at Todd Schlafer's and one of the participants asked me what kind of tree it was. And when I told him a ponderosa pine, he, he said, really, I don't, I'm not sure I believe you. And then he wanted to know what the secret was to keeping the needles short. And I said, well, I don't know. I just <clears throat> keep it in this container. It's been there for a long time. And then he accused me of not wanting to share my secrets. Um, but the container is, is the secret, I think. Uh, the other thing that containers do is that they stimulate aging. You know, back to Ryan Neal, he uses the analogy of a, a bonsai in the wild compared to a bonsai in the container is like a human compared to a dog. That whole idea of a human year is seven years to a dog. Well, a bonsai in a container ages seven times more quickly than a bones or a tree in the wild. Uh, finally, uh, one of the things that I found that especially shallow containers do is they promote the development of strong surface roots, which is something we often want in bonsai or Nibari. This is a fig that Terrell Samuelson had in the show last fall. <coughs> so how are we doing time-wise? Um, so since the bonsai containers aren't ideal for uh, horticulture, to be good at bonsai, you have to really know your horticultural craft. It's, it's the foundation of being good at bonsai. You can't have a great bonsai tree if you don't 
water it correctly, if you don't protect it from the elements, if you don't know how to take care of it in this bonsai container. So how do we compensate in these shallow containers? Um, we got to make sure that the pots, even though they don't have many holes, uh, that they drain well. Uh, this pot in the back has five holes. Um, we've got to make sure we have a close fit of the root mass. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but you don't want to pot uh, a small tree in a big container. That's a recipe for uh, bad things to happen. The other thing you want to do with bonsai is to make sure they're well supported in the container because if they're moving around, they're not going to grow new roots and they're not going to be healthy. This is a small pinion pine right after I collected it and I put it in a wood box with these vertical supports to wire the upper trunk to so there was no way it could move. Okay, let's switch over to aesthetics. What are the aesthetic functions of the container? Um, first is to frame or highlight the tree. Uh, they also, well, uh, let me back up. This was an amazing tree of Adam Johnson's in the last show, a Doug fir. Uh, and I think this is three, four feet tall, pretty big tree. And it's in a really stunning pot. Uh, Lubo Skoda, I think is Czechoslovakian, he's European anyway. Uh, but, you know, it really does uh, highlight this tree. Another function is to suggest a tree in a landscape. I think that's why many bonsai pots are wide and shallow. It, 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 it almost suggests the horizon as it does with this Korean hornbeam. This is another approach. Um, this is a elephant bush planted on a lava rock uh, Lou de Herrera had in the last show. And, and by the way, most of these uh, trees of members are from the last show. But I really think this is an amazing pairing of tree and container. And it really does suggest a, just a amazing landscape to me. Uh, another aesthetic function you can use the container for is to suggest the season. Um, a lot of times deciduous trees uh, are shown in the wintertime to show that really amazing branching, the ramification, and many of these that are shown for the winter silhouette have a cream or off-white colored pot, which I think really does suggest a winter view of this tree. Finally, the pot, and especially the color of the pot, can highlight a feature of the tree, like the orange flowers of this Chinese quince, the red fruits of this hornbeam, or the bright green foliage of this Chinese juniper, Shimpaku juniper. Um, all three of these are Kokufu 10 trees. So again, that's the most prestigious show in the world. So you don't get into that unless it's a pretty amazing tree and pot combination. And finally, uh, you know, I hadn't seen any of the sources mention this, but I think that container can also highlight the deadwood. Um, one of my pet peeves though is that in bonsai we use lime sulfur to treat deadwood as on this Chinese or, or uh, shimpaku juniper and it, it creates this bone white deadwood which it does look amazing but when I go out in the wild most of the deadwood I see is like this. It's multicolored, it's uh, multi-textured and it's just uh, amazing looking and a lot of the wild trees out there and collected bonsai trees have deadwood like this and I just wonder I haven't seen it but if you were to pot a tree that had deadwood accents like on the left there in a pot like this it's a Horst Heinzelreiter pot he's a European potter I think that could be really powerful. And then finally, um, 
function of the container aesthetically is to get out of the way. So to not try to uh, compete with the tree, uh, the container is always in support of or subservient to the tree. Let's see, maybe I should pause here uh, and see if David or Pat, I'm on time. If there are any questions, uh, are we on track? You're on. <clears throat> yeah, you're on time. Um, okay. There aren't any questions in the chat. I, um, real quick, though, that we talked a little bit about having trees in, in, in bonsai pots. I mean, also, I mean, was that tree in the pot for 15 years or did you repot it several times in the course of that 15 years? Yeah, it, it was in a, a similar size container for 15 years. It wasn't in that particular one. Okay. Yeah. And a side to that is that was uh, one of the earlier trees I, I put in a show, especially for new members, it's a little intimidating to put a tree in the show, but I really recommend you do, even if it's just one, because all the work you put into it to get ready for that show takes that tree to the next level or a couple of levels up. It's a, it's a really good way to, um, even though it might be intimidating to, to up your game in bone society. So, um, Mike, we did have one question. Matt wants to know um, where in Colorado one can collect that kind of lava rock, or is that a secret? It's, it's not. Um, so I talked to Lou de Herrera. His mother actually correct, collected that rock years ago. Apparently, she uh, had a you know an outdoor sort of rock garden, and uh, he he said they got it down towards. Um, Southeast Colorado, I think near Trinidad or uh, maybe uh, what's the other place? A little further north of there, I'm, I'm spacing out the name. But uh, you can collect rock um, on BLM lands, on National Recreation Area lands, in some Forest Service lands. You should check, but my understanding is you can collect uh, rock for personal use. Um, on those kind of multi-use lands, and of course, private lands. Mike, uh, this is Tom. I, I put a couple of comments into the chat as you were speaking. Um, you mentioned the, the reduction in the size of the needles in that Ponderosa that somebody didn't believe about. Um, and that sort of goes hand in hand with um, the theory that uh, when you put um, a tree like a ponderosa into a bonsai pot, and this is Ryan's theory basically, is that there's, there's only so much energy, uh, growth energy, if you will, that's in, the, in that container because of its constriction. So the natural result is if you allow the tree to maintain its, uh, its foliage, those needles will naturally get shorter uh, because there's only so much energy to go around, so to speak. Um, so that's a that's an interesting theory, and it actually came from uh, Ryan. Actually, uh, uh, adopted it from uh, Walter Paul uh, uh -huh. because he uh, he found out you know he was looking at some of Walter's trees and and seeing the reduction in needle length and began to realize that the reason was that you have a foliage mass and then you have uh, a restricted uh, root mass in the, in, the, in the container. And eventually over a period of time, those needles will just get shorter and shorter because there's only so much energy. So that's, a, that's an interesting concept, I think. It is too. And, and to add to that concept, I think Ryan also says that, you know, you don't, pluck needles on trees in early development like ponderosas and the idea being more needles yep. in a confined pot means that over time, each needle gets less of the energy and gets shorter. So right. don't pluck those, those trees early in development. Right. 
Okay. Well, I, I do have a lot, so I'm going to keep going. And again, David, keep me on track if I start blabbing. Um, okay. So uh, container size, back to horticulture. Um, I got a tree, a really nice Scots pine years ago at Paulino Gardens. It was a big tree. I got it in the fall sale. It probably had a five inch diameter trunk um, in a five gallon pot. And I thought, man, I'm gonna take care of this tree. So I'm gonna build a big box. And I built this big wooden box. It was two feet by two feet and you know, a foot and a half deep. And I planted it like this. So the, the nursery root mass is this crosshatch thing and the bonsai soil is the stippled stuff and it's floating in there and it's way too large. Don't do this. That tree never looked better than the day I bought it and it just declined slowly. Um, this is what I should have done, planted it in a fairly tight container that fit that root mass. And here's my theory as to why. The same thing applies to collected trees. Um, the tree on the left sketch is a collected tree. The cross hatches, the, the root mass you get out of the, the yard or the field, wherever it is. And that root mass has usually got a lot of clay and silt. Uh, it doesn't want to have a lot of air spaces. It dries out slowly and it doesn't aerate well. So if you put it in a big box like this with this coarse, well-draining bonsai soil, how do you water it? If you water it according to the bonsai soil, when it starts to dry out, you would water it every day. Well, what would happen, this root mass will never dry out, will never get air, and those roots will die. And that's the only place you have roots in this. So you have to water it according to the root mass, uh, the field soil, and if you water it According to that, you're going to water it every third or fourth day, every week, and the bonsai soil will never be wet enough to have roots grow into it. Either way, this tree is going to die. So the better way to do it is to plant it in a relatively or very tight fitting container. Uh, even if you have to cut off some of the fine roots in field soil, and I think the reason this works is you then water it according to the field soil, maybe, maybe every third or fourth day, but there's not that much bonsai soil. It's close to the wet field soil, so it stays humid and roots grow into that bonsai mix. And I'll show you an example. Uh, this is a tree um, that I collected in 2019. This is it in the field before I collected it. Uh, I was kind of intimidated when I got it because I had to cut four big roots. These are about an inch in diameter. There wasn't a great root mass. So I planted it in, in a wooden box that I had. Here's a close up. So I had a pre existing. Yep. Like for some reason, I think there's a photo missing. Uh oh. Oh, there we go. Oh. We were we were up until up until it changed, we were still looking at the sketch drawing of the containers. Oh shoot. Okay. Uh, should I back up? Yeah, I think if you back up for a moment just so people can see those two side by side photos of where it was when you collected it and what the root ball looked like when you got it out. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, there's some latency or something with my internet. Yeah, I think there's some latency. It seems like sometimes the it doesn't change as rapidly as what you're seeing. So, so here's a spring 2019, so not that long ago. Um, when I got it out, uh, I had to cut these roots, but I did have a pretty good intact root mass, but small. We just so now we're looking at the picture on the left, but the middle and the one on the right are gone. Gosh, I don't know what's happening. Shoot. There we Maybe go. I, you got them. <laughs> yeah. I'll talk slow. 
<laughs> so um, what I did, and hopefully the picture will catch up, was I planted it in a pre-existing wooden box, but I had to custom fit the box by putting this cross piece in. And so it was very tight widthwise, and then this little two by four chunk to make it really tight lengthwise. And, and, and what I like about a wooden box is it drains and aerates well. You can drill holes wherever you need to. You can easily custom fit them. The other thing, I, are you looking at the picture now, uh, David? But yes. you can anchor the top of the tree to the box so that it doesn't move at all, which is really important. And then finally, uh, wooden boxes are pretty well insulated. They don't heat up like a, a ceramic pot does. So I'm looking at now the spring 2021 version of this tree just before I repotted it. I have it up on an angle. I've styled it probably in the fall of 2020. Here's the, um, what the roots look like. They've, they've grown pretty strongly. And here's a close up. And you know, if you, you know about repotting, you wanna repot when the roots are starting to grow, you can see these root chips are pretty healthy, white and growing. And there it is in the bonsai pot. And, um, And here's what it looked like uh, just a few, couple of years later in the last show. Uh, David, are we on track with photo or uh, slides? We are. I'm wondering. I think you're using the PowerPoint where it will segue sh uh, shots into the same slide, basically. Yeah, they're animated. Yeah, it may be part, I don't know, the animation may be part of what's yeah. causing delays. And now we're looking at the uh, for Sarah. Okay. That's where I, yeah, that's where I hope to be. <laughs> All right. Um, so another situation with a tree of mine. Um, <clears throat> this tree is horticulturally in the right size pot, but uh, Larry Jackal, the curator at DBG for Bonsai, told me, Mike, this, this tree's in a pot that looks too small aesthetically. So, you know, here, here's a compromise. Um, now my, oh boy. Now my uh, screen's not advancing. There we go. Uh, so I got a bigger pot and I wanted to put this one in the 2021 20, show. Um, and I chose this pot because I thought the colors of the pot really matched the colors of the trunk of this bursera or elephant, elephant tree um, and the foliage of it. So here's what the tree looked like when I pulled it out of the pot in late 2020. Like a lot of succulents, uh, bursera don't have very strong roots at all. Uh, it's just a feature of them. So here's my big pot and I'm thinking, what do I do? Uh, I put drainage screens and support wires in it, but I put this cross piece in because I knew the, the pot was too big. Here's what it looks like. The root mass of the bursera fits in a pot this size. Um, here's the cross piece. I put some bone size soil in there just to fill it out. And here's what it looked like after it was potted. Um, I secured it with wires to keep it firm in the pot here. Here, I also used this wooden support to keep the tree at the right angle. Like I said, the roots of succulents tend to be really weak and they need that kind of support. Took it outside, put moss top dressing on it. And then here's what it looked like in the 
show last fall. So, like I said, this is a sort of a compromise. The pot's big and right aesthetically, but it's probably too small. So that's why I restricted the potting space in that pot with the two by four. Okay, um, a little bit more on horticulture and container size. The tree on the left is in a pretty big pot. It might be aesthetically too big, look out of balance with that foliage mass, but that tree is gonna continue to grow and develop. And if that's what you want, keep it in a bigger pot. If on the other hand, you have this literati tree and you don't want a lot of foliage, you want it to kind of stabilize, keep it in the small pot like the one on the right. This was from that bonsai today issue I talked about from 1992. And basically they say, you want it to grow, the pot size should be quite a bit greater than the crown or crown volume or foliage mass. If you want to slow it down, make the pot size about equal to the foliage mass or crown volume. And if you want to reduce it, make it smaller than the crown volume. They also say in that article that if you have a fruiting bonsai, which takes more energy to, to support those fruits, like this persimmon, uh, put it in a deeper pot. Also, if you have a rapidly growing bonsai, put it in a little bit deeper pot. Another uh, example of container size and horticulture um, I don't know if Daryl is on. This is a limber pine by, or of Daryl Whitley's. Uh, a few years ago, he did a really nice presentation on container size. Um, and, and what he noticed was that our MBS members and uh, American bonsai enthusiasts in general were potting trees in really small pots. And so Daryl traveled to Japan and went to that Kokufu 10 exhibit. And I think he actually measured some pots. Uh, and his presentation was all about, you know, think about having larger and deeper pots. Um, because if the, the best in the world are putting them in deeper pots and that's healthier, maybe we should be doing that too. Um, so in, in his tree here, that's a fairly deep and large pot to my eye. Um, so the tree is going to continue to grow. Uh, watering is going to be easier. Um, protection from temperature extremes is going to be easier. You know, overall, maybe this is a, a really good compromise um, or balance between aesthetics and horticulture. Uh, do you, does anyone know if Daryl is on? I've not seen him. Okay, I haven't seen him. So it must be true what I said. <laughs> I was going to ask you that because I remember his presentation. So you got there right ahead of me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to move a little bit to just aesthetic guidelines for containers. Um, the container aesthetically should be the appropriate size. It should balance and support the tree visually, not, not horticulturally, but visually. Um, again, it should frame, but be subservient to the tree. Uh, important too is that the container should mirror the quality of the tree. You don't want to have a world-class tree in a, a cheap mass-produced pot. And vice versa, you don't want to have an antique Chinese pot worth $10,000 and put a, uh, you know, a, a low class tree in it. So those two should match. Uh, we'll talk about this too, uh, the pot, if it's, uh, or the tree, if it's a more masculine tree should be in a more masculine pot and same with a feminine tree in a feminine pot. And as I said before, uh, the pots can highlight the important features of the tree. And then finally, older pots are better because they have this patina. 
um, this look of age that we value in bonsai generally. <clears throat> a couple more guidelines and all my sources agree on this. Uh, the width of the container should be for most bonsai styles about two thirds the height of the tree. The depth of the container should be about the width of the base of the tree right before the surface roots flare, right before the nabari. Um, but they all say too that these are guidelines and are a good point to start if you're wondering what size pot you should use, but you shouldn't be constrained by that totally. The only source I looked at that had advice on the aesthetic uh, balance between uh, foliage and the visual mass of the pot was David de Groot. And he said it should be 20 to 30%. So the container should be smaller than the foliage mass, 20 to 30%. I think this one's much smaller on the left. This tree in the middle may be about right in terms of that proportion advised by de Groot. And the tree on the far right, the sketch, probably more foliage than you would want aesthetically in terms of balance. Can you all see those three? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I, I'm not having the latency issues too much? Not too much. They're still there, but not, not as bad as it was that moment. Okay. I'll try to be aware of that. Um, this was a real interesting tree, um, Paul Koenig. Uh, J tree in the show last year, uh, that he has uh, as a spring cottonwood style. And I really appreciate that. This does remind me of uh, cottonwoods blooming in the spring along the creeks near Longmont and Boulder. Um, but his narrow container doesn't really fit those guidelines I said about, well, the pot should be two thirds the height of the tree. But it does to me emphasize the height of the tree. So I tried to compare that with a couple of sketches. Um, here's my sketch of his tree. And then here's a sketch of the tree with a much wider pot. And, and I do think that that narrow pot really emphasizes that the height of that jade tree. Aesthetically, uh, pot size and, and balance. Um, the tree on the left might have a pot that's too large for your eye in terms of balancing the foliage to the right. Um, but, you know, if you want the tree to grow, you could use a big pot like that. But if you're doing a literati, you might want to keep the balance uh, as it is on the right, where the foliage mass is well balanced by this pot here. It's not overbalanced like it is on the left, if that makes sense. So, Mike, before, before you go there, um, <clears throat> just a question. You know, how much does that kind of thinking require that you be in a situation where you can water your trees as, as necessary. I mean, that's many of the people on this call probably, you know, work during the day and, you know, well, how do you deal with the fact that if uh, you have it in a smaller pot and it may dry out on you? I mean, there are just some practical concerns, I guess. Absolutely, um, yes. And, and I think that the pot on the left is one, if you can only water once a day, go for that <laughs> horticulture trumps aesthetics. Uh, if you can water twice a day, you know, pot on the right is something you could do. Um, I also think that your experience with success with bonsai, if you've used deep pots and you get great results, you're going to aesthetically appreciate deep pots better than shallow ones. And, and if you use shallow ones and you can handle it, you're probably going to like those better. So... But yeah, small pots are harder. I, I should have said that in the beginning, David. That's a good point that 
you know, shallow pots are harder, but small pots. And, and if you do showing bonsai, those bonsai that are, you know, eight inches or less, um, you better be really good horticulturally. And, uh, you know, we have uh, some folks in the bonsai society are really good at those showings and you know they're really good at horticulture too. Thanks, David, that's a really good point. All right, this whole idea of feminine, feminine and masculine. Uh, feminine trees are thin truck, trunk trees with a light feel. They have graceful curves in the trunk and branches. The bark tends to be smoother or less craggy. <clears throat> Often they have brighter colors. Uh, a couple examples from the last show. This Doug Fir by Dan Kingery, real feminine flowing curves, really nice presentation and I think match with a pot and a stand. And then Larry Jackals, uh, Rocky Mountain Juniper, another really feminine tree in a, in a nice pot. On the other hand, masculine trees, they're thick, they're massive, angular branches, craggy bark, somber colors usually. I call them burly trees. Um, great example from the last show was Dusty Crafts Ponderosa Pine. Just an amazing tree uh, in a masculine pot. And then Bob Randall had this uh, boxwood, which was another great tree from that show. Uh, thick, angular branches, a craggy bark. Um, Really neat presentation to, um, and actually a little bit more feminine pot, but I, I think this was an awesome uh, masculine tree from that show. <clears throat> so if you got that masculine or feminine tree, put them in the, the pot that matches, you know, similar characteristics of the pot, make them feminine or masculine. Uh, let, let me back off there. Um, yeah, I don't need to read those. You can see them, but match your, your pot to the tree in terms of whether it's a burly tree, put it in a burly pot or an elegant tree in an elegant pot. And I'll show some examples. Um, one of the things about the pot is the visual mass will make it appear more masculine or feminine. Uh, the sketch along the top, uh, all those pots that I sketched there have the same diet or the same width along the rim, but just by angling the pot in just a little bit, it really decreases from like 60 square inches from the front of this rectangle to 43 for this pot. And you can see it's just much more elegant. Same goes with depth. Uh, the shallower the pot, the less visual mass and the more uh, feminine or elegant uh, a lighter tree can go in that pot on the right than this one here. The, the shape of the pot is the same way. Uh, a rectangle is one of the most um, sort of masculine sort of angular pots that there are. If you want to make it a little less so, you can cut the corners, make a convex corner or a lotus shape or then an oval, which is uh, you know, in terms of wide pots, the most feminine there is. Um, the pot color has an effect on that too. Uh, a lighter color pot, like on the left, is more feminine, less heavy, lighter than a heavy or a dark colored pot on the right. And that can influence, um, you know, back to your point, David, with that earlier slide, if you had a, a tree that you wanted to put in a deep pot for horticultural reasons, but it was a, a light tree, maybe you would put that deep, make that deep pot a really light colored or even a, a glazed light colored pot. You could do that. Proportion, this is from David Groot's Principles of Boneside Design. You know, a, a less wide, smaller container focuses your attention on the, the base of the tree. So if you have really good surface roots or nabari, Maybe you want a narrower container. Already talked about how a narrow or less wide container makes the tree look taller. 
De Groot says that the wider the container, the more focus is on the crown. In this case, a really amazing trident maple with great ramification. And you want people to look at this beautiful crown. I think it also makes the tree look shorter. But you can break these rules, as I said before. Here's a, a sketch I took from Boneside Techniques 2 by John Naka. And he, had, uh, he has a picture of a, a pretty small, modest tree uh, that he put in a pot that's three feet wide. Tree's only 10 inches tall. But what, a, what an interesting landscape that creates, at least to me. Okay, I'm back to horticulture a little because these things play off each other. I talked about this already, but uh, when you put a tree in a container, make sure it's close or the root mass is close to the bottom of the container. Don't have it floating up in the container. Also, um, don't do this. <laughs> uh, this is a gamel oak I collected last fall. Uh, and it reminded me of a workshop I went to with Walter Paul as the lead. It was at Adam Johnson's. David was there. Bob Randall was there. I think you might have been there, Dan. I'm not sure. Um, but we brought our trees up to Walter to critique and advise us on what to do. And I brought mine up and he said, what idiot potted this tree? <laughs> you know, he was right. Uh, what he recommended was I should have put it over here. And the reason I put this one on the edge of the pot, because all the roots are over here, but I would have been better off to put it over here a little. So at least roots would start to grow to the right and this tree wouldn't be so one-sided. Do you remember that workshop, David? Yeah, I do. Walter, Walter Paul. You called an idiot. Walter. I think we were all called idiots. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, let me. So, Mike, it's about eight ten. So you're you got about fifty minutes left. How five many? Zero. Five five zero. Five yeah, zero. I think I'm on track. Cool. If I can get if I can get my Slides to advance. Hang on. Hang on. I, I'm frozen here. It's so while, while he's doing that, Rich, um, how is Larry using that uh, styrofoam? He's lining lining the inside of the pots. There's a chat conversation going on. Oh, share, Zoom share. Oh, here, so I've unmuted. Um, that is going on. Uh, he mentioned it at a workshop last summer that I attended. Uh, we're talking about a comment I put in the chat that Larry is experimenting this coming summer uh, with lining some of the dark unglazed pots like, like Mike's got right here. Um, <clears throat> lining it with thin closed cell styrofoam sheets uh, right at the I, are you, can you all hear me yes okay got it go ahead Mike I will finish this later go ahead oh. can you all hear me yes yep. okay thanks I for some reason it froze up but I got it back um Placement in the container, potting height. This, this came from David DeGroote's book. Uh, if you put your tree in a container, like in this sketch, and the soil goes all the way to and maybe over the rim, when you water this tree, the water's going to run off and you're going to have an issue. So you, you can deal with it, but it's better uh, not to do it that way. You can do it like this, but so, so the water will run off, hit the rim, and then go into the pot. But this is probably too low aesthetically because you can't see the surface roots, and that's usually a feature you want to show. So you got to find the happy medium. 
in terms of potting height. So there's a little bit of a uh, indentation where water runs in, but the nabari is high, high enough for people to see. Okay, uh, on that theme of where to put the tree in the pot, um, I, I think probably any of you who do photography, and that's probably everybody, knows what the rule of thirds is. The idea is that uh, a photo like this with the main subject right in the center is not as interesting as the same photo with the subject not centered. So the rule of thirds is, you know, the focal points of a photo are here, here, and here. Um, this is a more interesting photo because it's off-centered. And that's why on your smartphone, there's a grid there to help you compose your photos in, in a more pleasing way. You can use that in bonsai too, where you're trying to figure out where to put the tree in the pot you use that rule of thirds, you know, on the left there, the tree's in the center, uh, it's centered front to back as well. Uh, and the recommendation by most or the guidance would be um, place the tree a little bit towards the back and off to one side. And maybe that's more interesting. Um, and this applies to wider containers. If it's a round or a square symmetrical container, that's not, uh, that's not as important because, um, you know, especially like a cascade or, or a tree like um, that big Douglas fir of Adam Johnson's, they look good when they're centered. But for wider containers, think about the rule of thirds when you place the tree. Um, another thing about placing the tree in the container, um, and this comes from Ryan Neal, uh, if you have a round container, he recommends not putting the tree uh, so the apex is centered over the container, but actually having the apex out to the side, one way or the other. All right. Um, I'm going to switch gears again to freeform containers. So we've been talking mostly about pots and the rules that you find are mostly, or the guidelines are mostly for, for pots, uh, but there's a whole universe of freeform containers, whether they're uh, natural rock, artificial, um, some ceramic like this one on the bottom left, uh, cement, resin, wood, metal, all these things. And, they can be really, really interesting. And, you know, there were a number of them in our last show. Um, but like I say, aesthetic guidelines are almost non-existent for those. <clears throat> I will um, talk a little bit about a couple that I've done, or at least one that I've done. Um, this is a granite slab that I collected quite a few years ago. I had the idea of trying one of these uh, rock plantings I use my hammer drill with a masonry bit to drill drainage holes and um, holes that I could use wire to secure a tree, uh, applied the drainage screen and the wires, um, put my bonsai mix down. Here's the tree, uh, the fall before I was gonna plant it. Um, I had had this tree for six or seven years ponderosa pine, I styled it, uh, and then in the spring, I planted it on this rock. And, you know, I, I was intimidated, but I, I got guidance from one of the Mirai live videos by Ryan Neal. And, and the way you do these things is you use, he recommends, a Akadama, solid Akadama mix. Um, but you place the tree on the slab, you wire to the slab so it's firm, then you start putting bonsai mix on. And when you, you get enough bonsai mix on you, on the outside start, it's almost like weaving long fibered sphagnum moss horizontally around the root mass. And every once in a while you put akadama into the sphagnum moss and you do this all 
uh, with a spray bottle in hand to keep it wet. And it's almost like working with clay and, and forming it into this mass. And then the last thing I did was I took <clears throat> native moss from my patio uh, growing on sand and silt, um, broke it up and then sprinkled it on the root mass. And, and then uh, two years later, I think, you can see the moss has grown in really nicely. And this was the tree in the show in 2019. Um, this is the tree today. It's, it's continued to mature. The, excuse me, the needles were pretty long in 2019. They've start, started to shorten up. This is another really nice example from 2019 show by Paul, uh, a blue spruce on, a, I believe, a granite slab. You know, in the horticulture of these things, I really find it pretty forgiving. You can water without risk of overwatering because there's no impervious container walls to keep the water from draining out and the air from getting in. You do have to be careful when you first do it because if you water it, you know, with your hose and you don't pay attention, that root mass will just kind of wash away. You also want to protect the moss walls <clears throat> from drying out and birds are a, a real pain. They love to forage for whatever's in the moss. A um, couple notes from Ryan Neal, like I said, use pure academa. And he says you never repot these things, um, but that you replace the, uh, or you put new academa or soil in um, at the base of the root mass of the rock. And I don't know if you can see it in this picture, but my tree is starting to rise up. And, and I've once or twice put in new Akadama to refresh the soil. Uh, this is uh, from Mike Karine, a RMBS member. Uh, he suggests with your moss uh, on these kind of plantings or, or even a pot planting to cover it with window screen to keep it from drying out too fast in the sun. And it works real well and it protects from birds too. Uh, in this right picture, uh, and this is a problem with uh, rock, natural rock, it can be really delicate and uh, it broke when I lifted it up. So I started keeping it on plywood and I don't move the tree by lifting the rock slab. I move it by moving the plywood. All right. Let's see. I think... Um, are there any questions that I should address, David, or discussion? Or should I keep no, moving? There are no questions in the chat, not unless someone has something. Otherwise, you, you can keep going. Okay. <clears throat> All right, uh, color. Uh, it's complicated. Every tree has at least two colors, the foliage and the trunk but it might have flowers, another color, fruit, another color, deadwood. Uh, and then the pot colors are infinite. So it can be hard and challenging to get a good match. A couple of guidelines. Um, one is smaller trees do better or, or can show better <clears throat> in a brightly colored container. This is a really small mame bonsai on the left. I, I forget the the, the actual defined limits for mame, but it, they're small, you know, several inches tall. Um, but a bright pot really attracts your attention, and that's good. Um, but on the other hand, if you have a really big tree and you had a glaze like that, it would overwhelm your eye. And so uh, the bigger trees tend to have subdued colors. And then in the middle, um, it, it's a gradation from brighter pots for small trees to more subdued to even more subdued unglazed pots for the biggest trees. Uh, here's a good example, I think. Um, so this hackberry on the right is just a, a massive and really impressive tree. And <laughs> if, if you're at the bonsai show and you have to show your tree right next to Will's, it can be overwhelming. You feel a little bit like, oh, gee, how do I get people to look at my tree? Well, one way is to have a, a nice pot like this that uh, is colorful um, for a small tree like this Shumpaku juniper. 
color too. I mentioned this a little bit, but uh, you can use complementary colors like this bluish pot to highlight the orange flowers of this Chinese quince or a green pot to highlight the red fruits of this hornbeam. Or, and this is from the show, uh, a reddish unglazed pot to highlight the, the bright green foliage of this boxwood. De Groot, uh, he had this interesting quote that um, the use of complementary colors is intellectually satisfying, but is rather strong. So be careful and use it only on small bonsai. I'm not sure if I totally buy that. Another uh, nice color combination is to use harmonious colors, colors that are adjacent on the color wheel. Um, and this Japanese maple by Dan Wiederecht is a really nice example. The foliage and the pot color are really harmonious and it, it gives a peaceful feel, I think, to this tree. I mentioned this already, but you know, leafless winter silhouette trees show well in these wintry pots, the white or um, off color, um, cream color pots. In, in, in back to guidelines, and I think maybe Tom mentioned this, um, you know, they are guidelines, uh, older and ancient appearing trees show well in unglazed pots, regardless of whether they're conifers or, or uh, broadleafed or deciduous trees. If you have a really big or really ancient looking tree, it's probably gonna look good in, in an unglazed container. Um, um, and, and De Groot echoes this, you know, they can be used with any tree. Um, here's a example of a series of trees from the last show uh, showing how, you know, darker pots, more masculine pots uh, show well with a ponderosa pine on the left that's very masculine. This is Dusty Crafts moving right a little bit, a, a more elegant pot for a little less masculine limber pine, one of my favorite trees from the last show. And then a even lighter colored pot shows off this Colorado blue spruce well. It's a less masculine tree. And then finally, um, this tree on the right, which is more feminine in a even lighter colored pot. And I, I did wanna ask, does anybody know whose tree this is? I, I couldn't tell from, the Mike Green photos. It reminds me of some of the trees that the artist called Bravo puts in the show, but I don't know. Mm. I wondered that. That that makes sense. Texture, um, in terms of aesthetics, not a lot uh, that I could find about this. Ba basically, the idea is if you have a rough, craggy bark tree especially, or a more masculine tree, you can use a textured pot like these two Sarah Rayner pots. Um, but personally, I think uh, a big masculine tree uh, can also look good uh, uh, against a smooth, um, smooth unglazed pot. This one, uh, a really interesting tree from the last show, or interesting pot and tree. Um, very textured in, in a really nice presentation, I think, of this blue spruce. Ornamentation. So a lot of pots have different ornaments. Um, a lot of them have these rivets on them. Ryan Neal says if they're at the top of the pot, it makes the pot look and feel lighter and more elegant. So you can use that to your advantage if you have a feminine tree. At the bottom, uh, it makes the pot look much more stable. And you can use that if you have a tree that's perhaps you know, leaning way out and, and you want it to be more balanced. And then middle ornamentation, such as this window, which is, uh, or picture frame, which is common on many bonsai pots, can make that pot look less deep. And uh, again, you can use that if you have a, uh, a tree that, you don't want to put in a deep pot, or, or you do want to put it in a deep pot for horticultural reasons, but you don't want it to look so deep, you might choose a picture frame kind of motif on the pot to do that. 
here's a, f a few examples. You know, this upper ornamentation on this Jim Robinson pot uh, is really elegant and makes the tree look light. Uh, there's that same tree um, with the ornamentation in the middle and makes that pot look less deep. And this is another tree, maybe by the same artist, uh, with ornamentation on the bottom. And it really is a very stable looking pot. Uh, not a lot to say about rims. Um, you know, there's pots with no rims, narrow rims, wide, flaring, decorated. Uh, they have their aesthetic advantages and disadvantages, I think. Um, just to highlight a couple from, I think this was the last show, this really elegant pinion pine of Tom's uh, is in a, a beautiful pot. Uh, I think it's a Japanese pot, but it's got this really nice flaring rim and it. It really adds elegance and lightness to the whole composition. And here's a, a, another uh, Japanese tree that I think has a you know really cool pot. So this really wide rim is unusual, but it, it gives it a very um, wide sort of landscape feel to me while the pot is still light and elegant, and especially with these feet and the negative space underneath the pot. All right, talking about feet, uh, they have a horticultural purpose and I think that's why they were first put on bonsai pots is to promote drainage. You don't want a pot without feet because that tree, uh, the water won't drain out of it. So even uh, pots like this often have a cutout uh, and it's not aesthetic, it's to let the water flow out Here's a good example of, of that, um, an American Larch by Dan Wiederecht. Um, and, and he's got this you know, really elegant little uh, drainage hole. If you, well, most bonsai pots do have feet. Uh, if you have succulents or trees that you keep on the windowsill in the wintertime, you never want to do this. I've learned this the hard way. Um, I keep them on the windowsill in these saucers and I go around and water them. And if I'm being lazy and I don't drain that water, the tree will die and it'll dry pretty quickly. So now I always water, then go back around and make sure I don't have standing water in the saucer. Aesthetically, the feet, like I said, I think they originated for a horticultural reason, but you know, they've gotten pretty ornate and, and interesting aesthetically. So if you've got a masculine tree, you want it in a pot with feet, kind of like on the left, straight angular oh, lines. You can make it more elegant if you have a more elegant tree by using stepped feet or curved and tapered. A lot of trees have these cloud feet and probably the most elegant are these cat's paw feet. Example of masculine feet in a tree, Steve Varlin's limber pine. Uh, this is a tokenami pot. Um, and if you have an interest in those, there's some really good information at this website um, about tokenami region in Japan and the pots that come from there. Uh, Another example of feet, a little more feminine. Um, I don't know if Normando's on the, on the line, but I think this is a tree he got from me. And uh, if he was on it, I would tell him I want it back. Uh, he did a really nice job on this tree, which I didn't know what to do with. And, and I thought the, the presentation at the show was amazing. Another example of a, an elegant literati ponderosa pine in an elegant uh, pot. <clears throat> Here's just an illustration showing that, you know, the cat's or tall feet with negative space under the pot really lightens the look of your presentation. And here's a Chinese elm of lasses that, that shows that I think really nicely. Um, Another thing to consider if you're uh, especially doing a cascade is that uh, cascades have a lot of 
visual weight on one side or the other, usually of the pot. And we plant them in these tall round containers that have three feet. And you want to think about visually what's most stable. If you aim the pot front in this direction with a really narrow look at the foot, it looks kind of unstable. So the recommendation is to put it with two feet facing forward so it's more stable. Um, here's an example of one of Tom's, I think from 2019, where he's got the uh, stability with that big foot uh, sort of anchoring that foliage mass moving to the right. Uh, here's an example of a, one of my trees. This is a big ponderosa with a lot of foliage on the left. I could have planted it in the pot like that with one foot forward, but that doesn't look as stable as planting it like that with two feet. So that's something to consider when you're putting the pot in the container aesthetically. <clears throat> All right, I mentioned this before, you know, it's really highly valued um, by many, most bonsai enthusiasts to have a, a old looking pot. Uh, and it's, got patina. Um, and this is an example from the Botanic Gardens uh, at Chatfield uh, of a pot. And I don't know anything about this pot, but it, it has a really nice patina to me. This is one of my uh, tokenami pots I've had for 20 or so years, and it's starting to get patina. And this is from um, De Groot's book showing what happens with a really old glaze pot. It starts to discolor near the base and that's that's a good thing. <laughs> you you want that in your pot because it it, it shows that age. Um, one of the things I learned by preparing for this um, and looking at John Naka's book bonsai techniques, well, both of them bonsai techniques one and two, is that um, <clears throat> a, a lot of Japanese bonsai enthusiasts and professionals you know, maybe most value antique Chinese pots. And this quote here from Naka's book talks about how they're patient and they use low fired methods. And that's the secret between, behind the quality of these great antique pots. Uh, he talks about how you tell uh, antique Chinese pot and then, you know, it, it was fascinating to me, they were imported over years into Japan and they have names for the periods, the old crossing for trees that were, or pots that were imported two or 300 years ago, uh, right up to the new, new crossing pots for ones that were imported after the uh, World War II. But uh, as I said, they're highly valued. And uh, it sounds to me like from uh, listening to uh, Ryan Neal and some of those podcasts that most uh, of the Kokufu entries are in not Japanese pots, not tokenami pots, but these antique Chinese pots. And these bonsai professionals will place the tree about a month before the show into an antique pot. And right after the show, they come out of that pot, goes on the shelf and the tree goes back into its uh, normal pot. All right, and I'll, I'll quickly go through um, Back to horticulture again. If you've got trees in development, um, you want a little different quality to your pots. These are some of the uh, features you want. And, and so I'll just go through some of them. If you're like me, you've got more pots or trees in development and you, you need pots for them. I've used ceramic bonsai pots, the cheap ones you can get at Lowe's. Um, they're relatively cheap. This one probably costs $30. Um, you know, they're not great though. Uh, they've got feet. You can make a close fit to the root mass. Uh, the one advantage I see for them as uh, training pots is that you start to reduce the height of that root mass. So they can be good for that. I've also used terracotta pots. Uh, I think those are nice. They have porous walls, so they aerate well you can get a close fit of the root mass because you can have, as Tom was saying earlier, a variety of pots at, at not too high a price. Um, they're light. Um, and the other thing is, you know, they're not 
great for supporting the tree, but you can drill with a ceramic drill bit holes to uh, insert wires for support. So I use those some, uh, I, I do like these mica training pots. Um, they're not too expensive. And, and a great thing about them is you can drill holes anywhere in them for aeration and drainage, but you can also drill holes along the rim uh, if you need to wire the tree to it, especially a tall tree to keep it from moving in the pot. Um, a lot of people like Anderson flats. As you can see, they aerate really well through the bottom. It's just basically a, one big drainage screen. Uh, they're not too expensive. This one here, 17 inches by 17 inches and four inches deep, you can get for a little less than $4. So they're great if you have a lot of trees in training. A lot of people are using colanders. Um, great aeration. Yeah, I, I haven't tried them, but both the Anderson flat and the colander um, are pretty wobbly. So uh, the tree's not too stable in it. So I don't, I, I probably won't use them. Uh, you probably guessed I like these wooden boxes. They have all the qualities uh, that I think are important for a tree in development. And they're, they're pretty inexpensive. I use um, old pallets I've found. Uh, sometimes I'll go to a construction site and run through the throwaways to, to scavenge wood. And I can build them in half an hour or so. Um, I really like those. And I don't know if anyone else has used these, but grow bags. I, I hear a lot about these. These are uh, some sort of mesh sometimes plastic, sometimes um, maybe canvas that um, people are using, maybe especially commercial growers. Um, so I haven't had experience, but I, I'm sure they, they aerate well and are good horticulturally. Yep, I use them, but for other purposes, Mike, but the only concern I would have would be similar to the Anderson flat. Mm. The, you get a lot of movement when you move it around. Because yeah. it, it doesn't have rigid sides, but I've used them quite successfully for uh, other purposes. Okay. And are they very expensive? Uh, no, not really. I don't know what the cost is, but you can get them there. You can get ones that are woven, some kind of woven fa fabric that's maybe a few bucks for each of them for a, you know, a gallon size type of thing. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it might be a good solution. You know, like I said, I have more trees that I need to develop than I have that are ready to show. So uh, I need these training containers for sure. All right, so uh, I wanted to talk a little bit towards the end here about um, pots for trees that are already on site or ready to be potted in a show container, if you will. Um, you want all those qualities that we've talked about. And some of the um, recommendations, uh, I won't go through these here, but these are some of the go-to sources that I've used. Uh, David added a few here. Um, and so They'll be available in the presentation on the website if you want to go to these uh, different uh, links, you can get to them. But I will talk about a couple of them. Uh, if you want not too expensive show pots, the Xi Jing, I think that's how you say it, pots from China, I think are really nice. They're relatively inexpensive. This one's uh, almost 16 inches wide and it's $70. Um, this is a Xi Jing pot that I showed earlier from my Ponderosa pine. I really think it's a nice pot. It's good quality. It won't. Um, I keep this tree outside a lot of the times and the pot won't uh, break with a frost, they're, they're good quality pots, although they are mass produced. Uh, I really like, um, but you can't afford a lot of these tokenami pots from the tokenami region in Japan. It's a, 
uh, historical ceramic uh, area from Japan because it has great clay. Uh, they make all sorts of ceramics in tokonami, including roof tiles and teapots and things like that. But uh, they do make bonsai pots. That's apparently a small part of the tokonami ceramics business. But anyway, you can get them online. Um, they're real nice. Uh, they're kind of expensive. This 11-inch rectangle is almost $220. Um, one thing I would say to you is don't shy away if you go to a good source from used containers because the number of them are used. And they have patina already built in and in a good uh, seller will show you pictures from the front, back, sides, top and bottom, and they'll tell you if there's any uh, chips in it, and they'll show you a picture of it. So I like those when I can afford them. Sarah Reyna uh, is an American bonsai potter, I think from Minnesota. Her pots are amazing. Um, I, I just went to her website, and she doesn't have any inventory up right now. I'm, I'm a little bit worried. Uh, the other really uh, great American bonsai partner, at least in my opinion, is Ron Lang, and he recently retired. And if you can get a Ron Lang pot now, it's going to be real expensive because he's he stopped making them. If you really want to go expensive, you can go to uh, some of these European pots that are available on Mirai Live. This is a Horst Heinzelreiter pot. Amazing texture, great. Mm -hmm drainage holes and support holes, everything, except it's over $2,000. Um, I don't know if Samantha's on, but she had a really interesting container in the last show uh, from RHD Boneside. These are cement. And um, I, I just thought they were beautiful and interesting. And David, I, I think you talked about there's a workshop on actually making cement containers coming up this year. Yes, I'm trying to line something like that up. Have a workshop about how to how to make slabs out of cement and containers out of cement. I haven't got all the details together, so more information forthcoming if I can pull that off. If you do, sign me up. I, I'd like to learn about them. Okay. Um, rock slabs. You can find them, um, and I have, but. They're heavy and they don't last long. You can get Jan Kulik slabs from Bone Samurai, but these are also expensive, but they're light. They're really durable. He gave a presentation to the club a year or more ago. Really neat containers for bonsai. Uh, the vertical ones, this I think is close to three feet tall, but it's quite expensive, available from Bonsai Mirai. Um, he does have a website, though, and I think you might be able to go direct and maybe get a better price. I don't know. Um, a lot of people use Lace Rock, which is, um, I think a lot of it comes from Utah. It's mined for the aquarium industry, and it's still expensive, $500 for this 25-pound rock, but uh, cheaper than, you know, an artificial slab by Jan Kulik. Um, we already saw this and I told you that, you know, this was a collected tree from, or a collected rock from Southern Colorado. Um, Lou told me, again, his mom collected it. And then when she was done with it, he sawed it off. So he sawed it flat to make this composition. Lou, Lou also uh, has this really nice um, elephant bush forest on a resin slab that he made. And uh, I asked him how long it take and he took and he just laughed and said, well, let's just say it took most of a winter to make, but really nice custom fit to his forest. And then finally, uh, I really like this uh, spruce. Mike, we, have a, we have kind of a, a real lag. It's just the resin slab just showed up. Okay, sorry. All right, now we're on the one by Linda. Okay. Yeah, so she collected this near Grand Junction and it really reminds me of, you know, the Grand Mesa out that way and, and trees that I see growing out in Northwest Colorado. Really small tree, but a, a nice presentation. 
if you want really nice pots at a really good price, there are a couple of RMBS members that make pots. Bill Sample, this is one he had in the show this year. Uh, this is another one of his um, really nice glazes, really good quality, and um, it's they're 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 really a value. He he won't charge much. I I know a, a number of people have said, Bill, you should charge more for your pots, but he doesn't. So if you you want a, a really nice quality pot, talk to Bill or Bruce Murdoch is another member who also make pots. Uh, in the Bonsai Society. And both these guys will do custom pots for you. Uh, I know Bill has a whole selection if you want to go visit him and, and see what he has. And then finally, uh, David mentioned there's an auction maybe coming up this spring. A uh, great place to get pots. Members um, donate pots for the auctions or sell their pots. Uh, it's, it's a really good uh, way to get quality pots. All right, so just to summarize really quickly, bonsai can't exist without the container. It needs to horticulturally balance with the tree. That's most important. Aesthetically too is important. It frames the tree, but it's always gotta be subservient. Don't overwhelm the tree with your pot. You wanna match the quality of the tree with the pot and match the nature of the tree with the pot. Um, highlight the features of the tree that you want to direct attention to and show age and patina if you can. <laughs>